Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream of History Bite Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Samuel Zinner. And today, we're going to be having a conversation about Philo of Alexandria, a Jewish historian and, and Old Testament commentator living uh, in the early 1st century CE. And he wrote some works in the late 30s CE, early 40s CE. Um, and he has written um, basically about combining Hellenistic thought and Jewish thought. Some scholars will debate exactly how he was trying to combine the, the, the two. And today we'll be discussing that. So Dr. Zinner, um, take the floor. Uh, what are your thoughts on Philo? What, what do you think about this guy? What do I think about him? All right, well, um, well yeah, shortly with the bio here, right? Mm -hmm. we, we really don't know when he was born or died exactly, but you know, in the ballpark, some, somewhere around 20 to 10 uh, before the common era. And we know he died after 40 or 41 of the common era because there's one really datable event in his, in his life. That's the, his participation in the embassy to Rome where he represented the Alexandrian Jews to Emperor Caligula in, in 40 of the common era. And um, let's see, the, the latest... Uh, really notable achievement and scholarship on Philo, just just for everyone's reference, would be uh, Maren Niehoff's uh, Philo on Intellectual Biography, uh, Yale University Press 2018. There's a, a lot of breakthroughs right, in that work, so uh, re I recommend it to the audience. It's, it's already been translated in a handful of uh, languages. And uh, he's... He's responsible for two basic sets of works. I'm, I'm uh, simplifying a little bit, but not too much. Uh, there was an early series of basically allegorically inclined works interpreting mostly the Torah, the first, you know, first five books uh, of the, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. And these were written for Jews, probably uh, students in a private school. Uh, that Philo had founded, and he, he had uh, was quite a wealthy family. Uh, Philo uh, was quite wealthy, and so this is the um, the type of activity, right? A uh, scholarly inclined, uh, rich person would be would be involved in, right? So he founded some kind of private school, and these allegorical interpretations of the Torah were written for that audience. Later. After the um, unrest uh, in Alexandria, where Philo was from, where he lived, uh, that unrest was, was uh, the local non-Jewish population sort of right, uh, stirring up and, and committing pogroms, basically, right against the Jewish community. Um, Philo, uh, uh, being a member right of a, a very important political clan. You, we could say, uh, right, was chosen to represent the Alexandrian Jews to the em Emperor Caligula in, in 40 of the Common Era. All right, and so with that shift to physical, geographical shift to Rome, uh, albeit it was meant to be temporary, uh, he produces a second series of works, and these are designed for a Roman audience, a non-Jewish Roman audience, or a pagan audience, so-called. Right, and so these were works like the life of Moses and also um, the migration of Abraham and works like this. Right? And so these were directed towards um, a pagan audience, a non-Jewish audience. They were sort of uh, apologetical works. And um, what's, it, it's important, this is, this is where some disagreement will come in, but I think this is where the important aspect of Philo begins. That is, right, yes, he, so he had these esoteric interpretations of the Torah that he had written for uh, Jews in his private school. But then these, these, uh, these works on Moses and Abraham and other patriarchs, uh, Jewish patriarchs that were written for the pagan audience, the Roman pagan audience, and we might expand that and just say Greco-Roman uh, audience, these are very important. Right, because we can't overlook that this is, he's doing something uh, similar to what Paul did, but with a major critical difference, 
Right? So Paul uh, was in his uh, own way reaching out to non-Jews right, to gain adherence to this new Jesus movement. Uh, it's basically a monotheistic movement. And this is what Philo was also doing without the Jesus component. Philo was trying to explain Judaism to non-Jews, right? Because th there was quite a bit of interest on the part of non-Jews in Judaism at the time. And the critical difference between Philo's, we could call it a mission, Philo's mission to the nations, right? Uh, and the difference to Paul's is that for Philo, he insists, right, on the literal application, the literal observance of the commandments of, the, of Judaism, such as circumcision and the kashrut, right? Whereas Paul was dispensing uh, Gentile uh, converts to the, to the Jewish uh, Jesus movement right, from, from those uh, rites. And uh, Paul allegorizes these types of rites, like circumcision, very famously in Romans 2, Paul allegorizes circumcision. And this, so Paul is exactly the type of uh, Jew that Philo attacks in his writings and calls them extreme uh, allegorists, right? Those who, uh, allegorize away, right, the, the rights of Judaism, the literal rights, rather than retaining an esoteric understanding of the rights, right, along with the literal rights. And the metaphor that Philo uses for this is the body and soul, right? So the body of the Torah, the body of Judaism, in a sense, right, uh, is the commandments and the rights, right? So, um, and the soul is the esoteric interpretation or the allegorical interpretation of these rites. And so you need the body and the soul in order to have a living organism. So if you do away with the literal uh, understanding, then you have no body, you have death, right? Uh, so you need both the body and the soul. You need the plain sense and the allegorical understanding both together. Right. And so th this was the difference. Another main uh, major difference between Philo's outreach or mission uh, to the nations in contrast to Paul's was that um, there is never a single line, not a single sentence in Philo that could possibly, by the, the greatest stretch of the imagination, be misconstrued or construed, right, as an attack on the Torah. Nothing Philo says about the Torah is ever negative, right? It's, it, uh, and uh, th there's no way that anything he says could be misinterpreted, right, as some negative attack against the Torah. He's quite positive about the Torah. And so this is the major difference to Paul. Because we look at Paul, we have all of these uh, statements that Paul makes that sound like attacks on the Torah. Now, there's debate on whether those are actually attacks uh, on the Torah. I believe they are. But for the sake of argument, we can we can say, all right, granted, Paul is not really attacking the Torah. But the fact is, the difference here to Philo is there is no way we can misinterpret Philo as ever saying anything negative about Judaism or the Torah. So this is a major difference between Philo and Paul. And so th they both had missions to the pagans. Uh, one was very positive about Judaism and the Torah when addressing pagans, and that's Philo. And one sounds very negative about Judaism and the Torah uh, when, when trying to reach uh, non-Jews, namely Paul. So that, that's how I would set this up, Jacob. How do you look at the biblical antiquities that never were attributed to Philo of Alexandria? I know that most scholars think that this is a later text and it was not written by Philo. Uh, yes, it's, uh, yeah, I'm well acquainted with, with the, the pseudo uh, Philo biblical antiquities. It's a fascinating text. It certainly doesn't read like uh, Philo 
in, you know, when I read it, or and I, I'm not aware of any modern scholar who uh, takes the attribution to Philo seriously. But uh, it, it, in itself, it's a fascinating uh, Jewish uh, document, uh, probably mostly compatible with Philo thought, but, uh, but a very different style. So what do you think Philo was trying to do when he was writing his text? Was he, do you think he really was trying to combine a lot of Hellenistic thought with Judaism and trying to alter Judaism or maybe um, just trying to reconcile but not alter Judaism necessarily? Well, we can uh, take a step back and see see uh, another way of looking at this. Right? If we take a, a view at a larger picture, what he was really trying to do, the essence of Philo in that regard was that he was trying to make, uh, it was twofold. He's reaching out to his own people, to Jews, and at the same time, he's reaching out to the non-Jewish uh, audience um, and populations of the time. All right, as far as the non-Jewish populations, what his strategy was, was to present Judaism to them as a rational religion, a rational system. Uh, a way of life, right? And so this uh, is where the, the application of uh, Greek philosophy comes into play, right? So th this, is the this is the main dominant philosophy of the day, Plato and the Platonic heritage. At that time, we would call it Middle Platonism uh, before the later shift after Philo's lifetime, right, into Neoplatonism with Plotinus, for instance, right? So he's trying to make Judaism look intellectually, philosophically respectable to non-Jews. Uh, and the motives were that he sincerely felt this to be the case. And also he wanted to try to educate the non-Jewish population about Judaism in a way that would um, tend to dissuade right, or decrease uh, anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. Now, uh, as for his outreach to his own people, what he's doing with uh, Platonic philosophy and other types of philosophy is he is trying to show his own people that Judaism is relevant, right? And that it is compatible with the dominant cultural ways of, of thinking, right? Intellectually, uh, scholastically, philosophically, right? So. Uh, he is trying to promote right, the survival of Judaism and the, the continuing practice of Judaism by Jews, because many were falling away. Many were becoming extremist uh, allegorists, as he would phrase it, right? no longer uh, observing traditions like uh, circumcision or kashrut. Um, uh, right? And so he wants to, he wants to make sure Right, that uh, as many Jews as possible will continue uh, observing their ancestral way of life. What do you think about Philo's logos? Um, I know that there are different opinions about the logos or what he means by that, but is that just another form of the Jewish God uh, as the word? Or do you think he meant something different by it? Well, first of all, all Philonic scholars are aware that, it's, that Philo is not, or was not, right? his works are not systematic on this point. That's, it doesn't mean he's, he's incoherent, uh, right? But, uh, or even inconsistent, but he's not a systematic philosopher or systematic theologian. In fact, it's, it, we're hard pressed to know how you know what to call him, right? With a, a clever label, right? Is he first a theologian and then a philosopher? Is he first a philosopher and then a theologian? Or how do we combine those two terms? Because he's he's really both, right? Uh, as I've explained. Now, when we get to the logos, of course, th this is really fraught with a lot of controversy because of the the various ways that uh, Christian theologians and philosophers who inherited the manuscripts, right, from uh, Philo's works, um, I would say exploited 
uh, Philo's works, right, for the sake of, of Christian theology, uh, relating especially to the doctrine of Christian doctrine of the Logos and to the doctrine of the Trinity, right? But here um, we, we need uh, uh, a lot of Christians, I think, need a cold shower over all of this. There's uh, really a fundamental and many, many stark differences between what Philo actually says about uh, the Logos and the system he develops and these Trinity sounding uh, passages, right? And uh, the best way to to uh, enter this arena, right, would be to point out, first of all, that in Christianity, uh, there's a lot of basically enthusiasm, right, for the Logos, for the idea of the Logos, and for uh, the person whom they consider to, to have incarnated the Logos, namely J Jesus of Nazareth. And so this uh, actually even then seems to become the center of, of most of uh, Christianity. Most Christian faiths seem to really be Jesus-centered rather than, you know, the God of Israel-centered. But um, now Philo says quite a bit about the Logos. But uh, when uh, the, the real essence of what he says is this, and he makes this in, for instance, his uh, books on uh, dreams, um, and that is that the Logos is this figure that uh, can help a person uh, achieve higher states of understanding of God. And the Logos is for people who have a poor, defective understanding. It's necessary because some people are there, right? But it's, it's for those who are at a very low level of spiritual understanding. And when the Logos uh, finally enlightens a person, right, to reach God directly, the Logos is of no longer of any importance. So it's like this tool, right? For Philo, the Logos is a tool to get you to God, right? And so, and then when you're when when you have you know reached God, an understanding of the the oneness and the unity of God, you know, you, the Logos falls away. Is uh, it is just a pedagogical tool, basically. Right. And um, the same with uh, his allegorical understanding of the, the Torah story where the three guests right, eat with Abraham or, or Abram. And um, it sounds very Trinitarian what he says about these three. Uh, but also he, he points out, he, he's very clear about this also. He says, well, understanding these three as sort of three different attributes of the one God is, again, it represents a very inferior understanding of God and the divine unity. It's for those right, who have not been enlightened yet, who, have, who are not capable of understanding this powerful concept of unity and oneness. So again, right, that tri that triadic uh, model, all right, of God is again just a pedagogical tool, right? You, so you can understand God is merciful and He has a side of judgment and all of this, so many attributes, uh, but it's really only one God. And so when you have this powerful understanding of the divine monotheism, the divine unity, right? These figures of the Logos or these, these triadic configurations, again, they're exposed as uh, pedagogical tools that then fall away. You don't need them anymore. So the Logos and these triadic configurations, and, and there are other types of configurations that Philo has, ultimately are these uh, have a negative valence in Philo. And so this is what is the stark difference between Philo's system and the Christian system, because the Christian system sees this logos and, and these triadic models involving uh, attributes of persons of God as something very positive and enduring. And in fact, you know, it's the ultimate level of Christianity. Right? So that, that's, that's how I would um, summarize Philo's logos doctrine and, and really sort of like throwing cold water, right? Uh, on on uh, the Christians who are under the impression that their most precious ideas, right, were anticipated by Philo of Alexandria, a Jew. This is really not the case, 
Uh, they took over a lot of his language, but they devalued the language or they they transvalued the language in ways that would make uh, Philo turn over in his grave, as the saying goes. Do you think that Philo, in his, do you think that Philo's views is consistent with the Torah, or do you think he made some compromises when he was trying to combine it with Hellenism? Well, again, let's let's take a step back and try to see the larger picture. Uh, even Palestinian Judaism. Right, uh, Judaism in Judea, uh, for instance, well, uh, was basically a, a Hellenistic phenomenon. Right, so we, we have to be careful there. Uh, I don't see Palestinian Judaism as any less Hellenistic than Alexandrian Judaism. And uh, contrary to some uh, earlier scholarly opinions, I believe that Philo of Alexandria's views, which we read in his works, were mainstream in, in Alexandria. And I don't think uh, very few people, I, if any at all, right, uh, Jews in in Judea, right, would have been shocked by anything he, he would have had to say. Um, so if you think of, you know, these intermediary figures that, that um, Philo talks about, the Logos and these personified attributes like wisdom, Sophia and all of this, if you look in uh, the Jewish works of the Second Temple period written in Judea, we have basically the same concepts. The, the language is different, but the concepts are basically the same. You have this idea of a personified divine speech or word, right? Um, and um, this is basically what you have in Philo. And um, Philo is very insistent, right, on maintaining kashrut, circumcision, uh, visiting the temple in Jerusalem, right, and and um, condemning the extreme allegorists who want to do away with all of that in the name of esoteric interpretation. Uh, I'm, I'm really hard pressed to see where anyone, uh, any Jew in uh, Judea would have uh, you know, had any objections to Philo's uh, basic uh, outlook. And you have, to keep, you have to understand as well, right? The uh, Jewish authorities uh, and, and elite in Alexandria, and in Judea, they were in regular contact, right? And uh, so this also explains why there is so much similarity in the thought, uh, not necessarily in the language and the expressions, but in, in the basic theological tropes, right? In uh, the diaspora is and Alexandria, where Philo was from, uh, and in Judea. Now I know that uh, throughout the ages, right? Um, Rabbinic Judaism right, uh, usually has very sour or reticent reaction to Philo. And those are basically because of the vicissitudes of history, right? And that's that Philo's works were preserved by Christians and promoted by Christians, and I would say misinterpreted and, and uh, by Christians. And so this, of course, had a negative effect. The um, on on, on uh, rabbinic Judaism, and also you know like in the in the Talmud, the 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 need for translating the Hebrew Torah into Greek right is seen as something that's negative right like the the Hebrew Torah is something very sacred very intimate right for Israel between Israel and and God, and uh, so the translation into Greek, right, rabbinic Judaism sees that as uh, somewhat negative or even tragic, right? So that has to be taken into account. Uh, but that's probably, again, I think, a later attitude that developed in rabbinic Judaism. Uh, at the time, uh, I don't think that same concern was in place because after all this translation, of the Torah, and I don't mean the entire Tanakh, but just the five books of the Torah into Greek by the so-called Septuagint translators, right, was supposedly sponsored, right, by the authorities, right, in Palestine, in, in Jerusalem, right? So I, I think that these negative feelings uh, about Philo and the Septuagint 
right? These are later developments. But uh, you know, I, I'm not disrespecting, you know, the the uh, I think the justified bad feelings, right, that developed in in rabbinic Judaism uh, later, especially over the Septuagint uh, translation. Do you think that the author of the Gospel of John thought that Jesus was Philo's Logos? Uh, was Philo's Logos? I'm not sure about the uh, phrasing there, but I would say that John has Philo's uh, doctrine or doctrines of the Logos in mind when he wrote that. And uh, so once you bear that in mind, then you can finally, uh, well, many scholars, of course, are fully aware of this. If you look at the Greek, Greek text of the opening of the Gospel of John, which is usually translated, what, in the beginning, in, Arche, in the beginning was the word, which is not, a, I don't think it's a, a good translation. In the beginning was the, the, the Logos, um, right? And the, the Logos was with God. Uh, and the Logos, right? was theos, right? So it, the the definite article is lacking there. So uh, Philo actually talks about this grammatical point. He says that human beings can be called God, theos, right? In some kind of metaphorical qualified sense, right? Because for instance, the Hebrew uh, Torah, right? Calls uh, Moshe, calls, calls Moses uh, God, Right, but not in the in, not in an unqualified sense, but sort of in a, a qualified metaphorical sense, a functional sense. And right, so Philo points out we can call humans theos, but we cannot call any human ha theos, the God, God as such. All right, and so this is exactly what we see in the opening of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and the Word was a god the word was divine to to stretch the grammar there the literal translation would be a god right and then that's reflected later in the same chapter when uh john says where he refers to the father god the father right and the only begotten god who is in the kolpos or the lap or the bosom of god the father Right, so that's the begotten God. So the Father is the is the unbegotten God, God as such, the God of Israel. Whereas this this Son, who is the Logos figure, right, is a God, is divine, right, is is and is begotten, not unbegotten. So begotten. So this would not agree. Right. So this would not agree with later Christian theology, which sees the Logos as eternal. Right. But they get around it. Right. With Platonic word games such as, well, yeah, he's begotten, but in an eternal mode. Right. So uh, in any case, uh, John is quite clear that the Logos is a God, is not the God. And this is exactly the point that Philo makes. As I said, we can, he says, we can call human beings theos, but never ha theos, never God as such. I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about apparent allusions to a trinity or what some could interpret as a trinity and Philo. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? Like, uh, what was Philo saying about that, actually? Well, I'm referring specifically to his allegorical interpretation of the Torah story about uh, Avram, right? When he had three guests and they come, they eat with him and uh, they basically tell him, well, you're going to have a, a son. And then the story is that uh, Sarah or Sarah uh, laughed right? because they were, you know, since, you know, 90 and 100 years old, respectively. Right. And so it's that Torah story. Philo gives this allegorical interpretation that these three guests were like these supra angelic uh, entities who represent allegorically, metaphorically, represent different divine attributes, right? Basically. And um, this is of a piece with Philo's doctrine about the two divine names, Kyrios and Theos, Lord and God, 
right? So uh, theos usually translates the the Hebrew uh, Elohim, right? And kurios is the usual translation for the tetragrammaton, right? Yodeh Bav Hey in in the Hebrew Torah, right? So these it become in the Septuagint and in the old Greek translations of the other books of the Tanakh, right? Theos and Kyrios. Now, uh, Philo has this doctrine where he says that Theos represents the goodness of God, the divine goodness, right? Whereas Kyrios is more like the, the, the authority, judgmental, right? Uh, rigorous, um, manifestation of God, right? And so the three guests, right, are all interpreted in, in these types of senses, that they are all God, but they're representing different aspects, different attributes of God, right? Uh, which, of course, as you know, in Judaism is, is not, uh, you know, an odd thought, because after all, in one of the most important parts of the Torah in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Right, we're given 13 attributes of uh, God's mercy according to you know the the, the standard uh, Talmudic interpretation. Right, so God is He's merciful, He's gracious, He's forgiving, all of these. Right, so what uh, Philo is doing is he's basically personifying these different attributes. Right, and uh, so these three guests are he says are representing three different attributes of the one God. But again, he says that this representing these three as three attributes of, of God, this is for those who have an inferior understanding and are not able to conceive of pure unity and, and absolute oneness, right? So this can be a help, right? To, to make people understand how a one God can have various different attributes, right? To his nature, right? But once you do understand the absolute oneness of God as such, right, the, these, this allegorical interpretation of these three guests is, is no longer necessary. And it's seen as just a pedagogical tool. And it has, you know, sort of for people who have uh, a poor understanding, but, you know, they have to be helped too, right, to, to have a higher understanding, but they have to begin where they're at. And so uh, this is what Philo is doing. He's giving them a lower doctrine, right, uh, as a first step to a higher step, where at the, the earlier steps will be abandoned, right, uh, again. Um, so there, there's, there's nothing, I think, even remotely resembling the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in what Philo has to say, uh, you, you know, in that allegorical interpretation. Is Philo talking about the three men in Genesis 18, 1 to 2? In which uh, when Abraham looks up to, to look at the Lord, he says, behold, three men uh, are, are uh, looking over me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, so Philo is just giving uh, an allegorical interpretation of that. You know, and it, it's also, um, we can go back to Exodus to, to uh, reinforce a point I made earlier uh, uh, and this point here too. And that is, um, where where Moses asks God, I you know says I let me see your your glory. Let me see, and then God says, well, no no one can see my face, but I'll let you see my back, right? But even that, God says, you know, I'll put my hand over you, so and you, you can only see part of my back, right? Uh, but anyway, the point is this: uh, in that in that that portion of the Torah, it has to do with the uh, the sin of the golden calf. And God tells Moses, I'm going to wipe out this people. Look, now I just I just performed a national revelation for them at Mount Sinai, give them the Torah, and look what they do, right, the next step. And so uh, Moses prays and says, look, if you're going to destroy them, destroy me. You know, erase my name from the book of life too. And um, God says, um, all right, all right, I, I forgive the people. So what happens? Moses goes down, breaks the Ten Commandments, and, uh, you know, about 3,000 people are killed, right? And so it's very odd because God has said, I've forgiven them. And yet Moses goes down and, and uh, you know, this, this horrific judgment takes place. All right, and then, uh, but, you know, leading up to that, right, when Moses says, all right, don't destroy these people, 
forgive them, right? If you're going to destroy them, destroy me. Um, before God tells Moses that he has forgiven them, God says, all right, look, they're stiff that people. I'm going to destroy them, and I will not be, my presence will not be with them. Instead, I will send my angel ahead of them, and my angel will not forgive them. He's not forgiving because my name is in that angel. Well, this angel with the tetragrammaton in it, right? This again, it's like a Logos figure, and Christians love this type of thinking. Oh, the angel of God with the tetragrammaton in it, right? And it's the, uh, the, the anticipation, the forerunner of Jesus, right? All oh, this figural type, typological way of thinking in Christian theology. But it's totally negative in the Torah. It's, it's, it's horrific for Moses because it's, no, don't, don't give us an angel with your name, uh, you know, in, in the angel. We want you, right? We want you directly, Right? So we want God directly. And this is how Philo sees uh, his whole theological, philosophical program. He wants to use this angel or this logos type of idea to bring the people back directly to God. And then they can do without this logos figure. Right. So they want um, God directly. And then th this is what Philo wants to help people attain uh, a, a knowledge of God directly without these intermediary figures at the final step, right? When you reach this understanding of the divine uh, unity, you don't need the Logos anymore. You don't need the angel with the tetragrammaton and the angel. All of this falls away, right? Each and every uh, Israelite, right, is like this priest to God or, or, or has this royal aspect to them. Well, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Doctor Zetter. It's my pleasure, Jacob. I look forward to our next discussion on the Enuma Elish. Yes, I'm looking forward to it as well. And for those that don't know, it's uh, it's going to be on uh, November the the sixth at twelve p.m. Central Time, and we're going to be discussing the Enuma Elish and its parallels to the Bible. I can't wait for it. All right. Thanks again, Doctor. You're welcome. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.